Publications Editor on Phyllis's book. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Naomi Thorson Kruger, for those of you who knew me when I was a student, <laughs> professors. Um, is this on? Is this loud enough? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a development editor at Spark House Family, and I worked on this book only a little bit, but I'm a part of all of the production and um, development of all of our picture books, so I'm going to be talking about the editorial process. Okay, and I'll start um, by talking a little bit about it. Yeah, you can see. We'll be back. Um, I feel like I am on a game show. <laughs> like this or um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the derivation of this book, Thanksgiving in the Woods. Um, you'll see some uh, photographs around here, and these are from my family's, uh, extended family's, actual Thanksgiving in the Woods. Um, I have a brother who lives in upstate New York with his a wife and, and family, and for the last 20 years they've held Thanksgiving outside on their farm, uh, down in the woods, uh, under a hemlock grove, and it attracts whoever wants to come. It's open to all, and they get about 200 people probably, um, and they have turkey and all the Thanksgiving fixings. Um, so I've been to Thanksgiving in the Woods about five times, and some of these pictures are from different years. Um, it features, um, I think this is probably, this uh, photo of my brother's gives uh, the best picture of what the setting is like. Um, oftentimes it's snowing, raining, um, and they have a whole crew of friends who work hard and long to put up huge tarps. Um, they're always, at least two big bonfires, um, and there are pots of soup for the people who come early. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a huge event, but it also is a wonderful way to do something different that's inclusive. Um, new Americans, new immigrants, people who've landed in the airport and didn't, got stranded and didn't have any place to go. I mean, there are all kinds of people who come. So it's, it's a great, great time. Um, I have a number of relatives who are uh, musicians, so there's always a lot of music and um, dancing and singing and all kinds of carrying on, as one could imagine, into the wee hours of the morning. And then recently they've added a new dimension, which is a pig roast the following day, um, which my son started. I don't know exactly. I, it, uh, there are a number of Serbians who are involved, and that's that's something that's um, customary in Serbian culture. And so they use the big bonfires to roast the pig and have a pig roast the following day. So anyhow, that's something that um, that's the actual Thanksgiving in the woods. So the starting was his really awesome Thanksgiving tradition. And more than that, I think it was a sense of openness and inclusion that I, I saw illustrated through um, the work that they did. Um, because after Thanksgiving in the Woods, everybody treks back to their 250-year-old farmhouse and, you know, has more food and fire in the fireplace and partying and carrying on. So. Um, it, but it, it really was something that resonated with me. So that's an idea that kind of was floating through my mind for a long time. But how to narrow it down and turn it into a children's picture book was a, somewhat of a challenge because there are so many characters, so many aspects to it. Um, I, I guess I would say, and this is a case with my, my other children's book as well, this one only had to stew for about five years, so that's not so bad. Um, it takes a while for ideas to get refined, to do research and interviewing, and really hone it down to one fine point. Uh, children's picture books nowadays, they used to be much longer in terms of word content. On average, they're 500 words or less or fewer. Um, that's not very many words if you're trying to tell a story. So it, you really have to... Uh, think more like writing poetry than anything else. Um, and, and you have to determine the best vehicle for conveying your idea, because it might be that it's, it should be uh, a young adult novel or a, uh, you know, a middle grade reader or a different type of book. Um, but I, I always saw this as a picture book. I could see it in my, my mind's eye. 
Um, so that was what motivated me. Uh, one of the first steps for me was talking to the experts, and that was the kids who are involved. Thanksgiving in the Woods is just thrilling for the kids. Um, this is a, a farm of 200 and some acres, and so for kids, especially city kids, to get to be free to run around and, um, I mean, they go down before Thanksgiving in the Woods and they'll have like a walkie-talkie system where they're keeping, you know, in touch with home base about what they're doing. Um, they have their own version of Thanksgiving where they have a, team, you know, a little uh, tent and all kinds of things. So I, t I interviewed my nieces and nephews and found out what they really liked and what their favorite foods were and all those kinds of activities. And, um, and that started to give some form to the idea. Um, I, I'll um, link to this in just a second if I can figure out how I'm here. Uh, but in writing the book, I, I felt like it lacked um, a thread to tie it together. And I found that thread in uh, the song Simple Gifts, or Tis a Gift to be Simple, which they always sing at the real Thanksgiving in the woods. Um, at one o'clock, my sister-in-law rings a bell, everyone holds hands, they make a huge circle, no matter how huge it is, and sing um, Tis a Gift to be Simple. And that kind of um, is illustrative of the focus on being thankful for simple gifts that you enjoy outdoors in a, a simple setting, which is really majestic. It's not simple in any respect. But um, so that became part of the book, and I think it strengthened it a great deal. And then um, Sparkhouse, um, wisely in my mind, um, included the um, music and, and lyrics to Simple Gifts at the back of the book. And I'm so thrilled with Sparkhouse. I mean, how many publishing companies have their own in-house choir? Leave it to the Lutherans. I mean, <laughs> they know what they're doing. Okay, Anne, I don't know how mm -hmm. I can get, oh, here we go, maybe. Here we go. So this is what they produced. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you want to be. And when you find yourself in the place just right, will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning we come round right. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down you find yourself in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning we come round. So um, that song became kind of the, the centerpiece of the book for me, and it's tied together in the, the um, content of the books, of the book, and then um, it's been fun to have this piece as kind of a promotion piece as well for the book. So that's just a quick overview about how the book came to be, and I have so enjoyed working with people at Sparkhouse. It's really been fun. Um, so I'm going to just turn it over to Carla. Thank you, Phyllis. Well, uh, I can tell you that it was a delight working with Phyllis, too. It, uh, it, Naomi will talk more about the editorial process, but I can say that this is one of those really rare, rare manuscripts that I don't think we really changed a word. Like, it came fully formed and ready to go, and we just sort of had to give it some some format to get out into the world, and it was done. So that was really unusual. So it was just a delight to work with Phyllis on that front, too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the publishing process. And I'll kind of start on the front end, and then Naomi will pick up the kind of the nitty-gritty of the editorial process. 
But we, um, we are a religious publishing house. As Phyllis said, we are the Lutheran publishing house. We're owned by the, the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Um, but we publish, Spark House and Spark House Family publish uh, resources for all kinds of churches. We're an ecumenical publishing group within the bigger 1517 media company that we work for. So we are always on the lookout for mm -hmm. books that promote um, kind of Christian values. They don't have to be explicitly Christian. Phyllis's book is a great example of this. There's nothing in it that talks about Jesus or that says, you know, that this is a, a Christian ceremony. It's just sort of woven in, or a Christian event. It's just woven in. It's woven into this traditional shaker hymn that keeps kind of popping through the book. And really just in this sort of the values of community and inclusion and family and thankfulness and gratitude. That's really where you see kind of the Christian values bubbling up in this particular story. We have other books that are more kind of overtly Christian in their message that talk about Jesus, talk about God, they're about prayer, um, and other things like that. But Phyllis's is an example of sort of the, the broadness of our range of the books that we publish. So we get books from a lot of different uh, resource, or a lot of different outlets, a lot of different places. They come to us in a lot of different ways. The, Probably the primary way that we acquire manuscripts as a publisher, and this is true for most publishing companies, is through agents. Um, there are literary agents out there who work with writers to kind of formulate proposals and get their manuscripts shaped up, and then the, the, the agent is the one who sends uh, the query to a publishing company. It's rare these days to find a publishing house that won't want you to come through an agent. So if you've ever, if you've got a book bubbling in you somewhere, know that the first step is to sort of figure out what kind of representation you'd want. And an agent isn't just somebody who sells your book for you. They really know the market, and they know a lot about books themselves, and they're really a great partner in crafting a manuscript that would be ready for publishing. Um, I know probably most of you are not thinking about publishing a book anytime soon, but just know, when the time comes, start with an agent. Uh, but we do get some books sometimes just through connections. We're a pretty small publishing house, and Sparkhouse Family is a fairly new imprint. And so as we're trying to build uh, a catalog of resources and a catalog of books, we're kind of on the lookout for manuscripts all the time. And so sometimes it's we find a manuscript because it's somebody we know or somebody says somebody sends them our way and they don't have an agent. That's a little bit more unusual, but it, it is true for kind of smaller publishing houses like ours and newer publishing houses. And then another way we find manuscripts, and this is how we found Phyllis's, is through writing events. She, was, uh, she submitted it at the Festival of Faith and Writing, which happens every other year at Calvin College. If you haven't gone to that and you're thinking about a career in writing, it's a really fantastic event, and I would highly recommend you go. Um, but there are lots of other little writing seminars, writing conferences, and those are great places to not only workshop a manuscript, but a lot of them now have a submission process, and there are editors there who are looking. So Phyllis submitted this on a format called Submittable, which is sort of an open source. You just load up your manuscript, and, and it can have a specific event sort of folder. And then editors like me, who are at this event, will go look and see what we find. And that's how I found Phyllis's. And I knew her name because of uh, our common Bethel connection. But it was also her manuscript that really popped out to me as something unusual and something interesting that might be a good fit for what we were doing at Sparkhouse Family. So then, once we sort of get a manuscript in front of us, the question is, what are we looking for? What do we, how do we know this is a book we want to publish? And we have um, some kind of squishy things. We're all book lovers. People who work in books tend to be book lovers and pretty avid readers. And we have pretty firm opinions and pretty clear ideas about what we want. And sometimes those things are kind of gut level responses to what we're reading. But there are some sort of clear check marks that we go through mentally. And the first is that this author, this manuscript, has a clear point of view and a clear voice. And those of you who are English majors, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about voice, right? That there's, there's a perspective, there's a, a tonality about the book that is consistent and flows through and feels like it's the right tone for the story it's telling. It's serious when it needs to be, or humorous when it needs to be, or lighthearted, or whimsical, or whatever it is. We're looking for that tone and that voice and making sure it really is um, is unique and kind of striking to us. We're also looking for a surprising story. Children's books are, it's a huge market, a huge market. And even religious children's books is a really big chunk of that children's market. And so finding something that's going to stand out in that market as a printed book is a big challenge for publishers. So we're always looking for something that's somehow going to take even a familiar story, a story about a Thanksgiving celebration, and do something new with it. 
Um, so in Phyllis's case, this story came, and it had, again, this refrain of the Simple Gift song, but also just the setting, the fact that it was, uh, that it was set or based on a real event. That was great. And the fact that there's not a lot of really great Thanksgiving books out there. It's sort of the missing holiday. And we thought, this is an opportunity to, to publish a book that is really um, has a great way of helping families and communities and extended families consider the beauty of this holiday and the, and the meaning of this holiday in a different way. So that was surprising for us. And that's sort of what drew us to Phyllis's manuscript. So she had this very clear voice, this very uh, kind of reflective, lovely, uh, calm, um, charming voice going on, and then it was this great surprising story. We also, because we do picture books and children's books, we're always thinking about the visual piece. So as we're reading the manuscript, can we see it coming to life on the page? Um, Phyllis's book is a little bit unusual in that it has a fairly high word count for a picture book. A lot of picture books are about 250 words. So you really have to have a story that can be shown visually. You really need it to be something that you can instantly see as an author how this is going to show up in illustrations. And again, with Phyllis's, when we were reading it, I'm starting like, I can see the Pinterest boards already. You know, it's like hay bales and twinkly lights and the trees and the snow. It's all, you know. So it came together. It was obvious how we could illustrate this and how it would come together. And Naomi will talk a little bit about how we find illustrators. But that visual piece, especially in children's literature, is really crucial. We have to be able to visualize what's this going to look like on the page. And then finally, and this is where that gut reaction comes in, did it spark emotion in us? We've read some manuscripts. We have a book that just came out about grief, and none of us could get through it without crying. And it's not that it's this super heavy book, but Phyllis's is the same way. You read it, and you feel this like warmth. You're like, oh, I want to be part of that. Like, and that emotional response, you can't predict that in a manuscript, but when you feel it as an editor, you're like, yeah, we've got to do this book. Because you know that if I feel it, and I'm a fairly jaded reader, because I read so much, <laughs> that other people are going to be like, if I feel it, they're going to feel it too. And that's when you know you've got a winner of a book. And so again, with Phyllis's book, it was baked in right from the beginning, this charm and this delight and this sort of warmth, like, I want to be part of what's happening there. So she captured that so beautifully, this great event. I mean, you can see in the pictures. But to be able to capture that feeling in words, that's the sign of a tremendously gifted author. So we felt really fortunate to find Phyllis's manuscript. Um, so that's sort of the, how it gets to us. Then we, uh, we worked with Phyllis to say like, hey, we're interested, is it still available? And Phyllis said yes, and we met, and we had coffee, and we talked about what it might look like to do this together. And we came to an agreement, and we purchased the first rights to this manuscript from Phyllis, and off we went. So Naomi will tell you sort of what happens once we say yes and the author says yes to a partnership. All right, so we have a manuscript, and we love it. And we decide at that point when this is going to publish. Usually, it's a year or two or three ahead of time. So like right now, we're acquiring books for 2019. And um, we're, we're getting those lists filled up for fall and for spring. And we're starting to think, oh, actually, maybe this book would be better for spring 2020. And so it's, we're always working way ahead, so I never know what year it is. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait, 2017, like this book is out now, and I'm, I'm thinking already the next books. So I get, the, I get the manuscript, and the first thing I think about is, does this manuscript need editorial revisions at all? And usually if it needs revisions, they're not many, because we wouldn't acquire a manuscript if it was in a rough shape. But sometimes there's like a moment that needs to be honed. Or a beat, you know. There's a page, or there's just one character that needs a little bit more development. So then we'd work with the author on that, and we'd give them a final manuscript deadline based on when the publication date is going to be. Um, so they they get started on that, and then meantime, I'm looking for an illustrator. So usually I look through an agency. It's it's really hard to find individual illustrators just out in the world. There's millions of them, and they have their own individual websites. And if you know of them, you can go look there. But man, that would take way too long. So we have one particular agency we like working with, and we've worked with people outside of this agency too, but they're called Bright, and they're based in England, actually. And we go on there, they have an online portfolio of all their artists from all over the world, and we just look through, and we look through for the style that we think would help this book. Um, sometimes we ask authors, hey, what kind of style do you imagine for this book? Um, ultimately, our team chooses the illustrator, and. Uh, unless, of course, an author-illustrator came to us as a pair. That sometimes happens. Or an author is an illustrator themselves. That sometimes happens, too, but not very often. 
Uh, so then we find, we find an illustrator, and then I contact the agent, and I say, hey, we would love to work with that illustrator on this book. Can you share them this manuscript, how much we can pay them? And usually, they're like, yeah, we want to do it. Sometimes they're like, no, they're not available. They're like, oh, yeah, so then we find someone else. But usually, we find just the perfect person. And then at that point, um, eventually, we'll have the final manuscript, we'll have the illustrator, and then I will work with the illustrator to brief the art. And so I know in this case, Carla looked actually, she did, she did go on Pinterest, and she found some pictures, as well as having these pictures from Phyllis, uh, to send to the illustrator and say, this is what we have in mind. Um, some illustrators want a specific direction like that. Others, we give it the manuscript to them, and we just give them very light notes, and then they come back to us with some sketches, and we say, oh yeah, because sometimes an illustrator, they have much more ideas of uh, what it could look like visually than me as a word person. You know, I can give them some direction, or especially if it's something that has more technical things, like if it's a Bible story, I might say, they need to look Middle Eastern. No white Jesus, please. <laughs> um, if you need help with knowing what some of these uh, people might look like, here's some websites, here's some details about that time. Uh, but we wouldn't necessarily tell them exactly how to lay it out on the page. They would decide how that goes. Um, yeah, so we're, we go through what we call design routes and pages. So an illustrator would send us their sketches, and then we send those sketches with the manuscript to our designer, who might be an in-house designer, might be an external freelancer we work with, and they lay out the art with the text, they choose fonts, the colors, and then they send us back something that we call first pages. And then as a team, we usually print them out, we put it up on a pin board, and we look at it together and we say, oh, this looks good, or you know, that font isn't quite speaking to me, or this, that, the art is conflicting with the text here, let's talk to the illustrator about moving that around. Or we don't like how that character looks, let's ask her. You know, so we kind of do some collaborative feedback. Sometimes we send the sketches to the author. Um, just kind of depends on what we've worked out with them in the contract. But then they go on to maybe another round of sketches or to color art. Right now I'm working with an illustrator who's doing watercolor. And so she's working on painting right now. And then she's going to send us a scan. And that's going to be exciting to see. But once it's watercolor, you can't make any changes. So you have to make all the changes that you want to the art at pencils. So, yeah, there's, there's cover design, there's interior design, am I missing anything? That's basically the process, and then once the book is done, of course, in a little bit meantime, our marketing team is also <coughs> working on stuff. And they're working on stuff with the author. We have an author questionnaire that people like Phyllis fill out that gives all the information about themselves, all the connections they have to anyone in the world that's interesting, any places <laughs> they've worked, any places they've studied, and they put together a marketing plan. Um, so right now, the Phyllis's book had just launched. The editorial team is basically done with our part of it, and the marketing team is taking it and bringing it out into the world to get publicity. And Phyllis's work is also beginning again because she is to help promote the book and go to events like this. So really, when your book is out, your, your job is really just beginning again because even with a marketing team, you need the author because people are much more interested in meeting the author than meeting the editors, usually. <laughs> so this is kind of unusual for me to go to an author event yeah, and talk about what we do. So I'm glad we're among fellow English nerds who are interested in this kind of thing. Uh, I also wanted to just mention that we have some books for sale at the end, if you're interested, through the Bethel Bookstore. Um, cash or check to them, or they'll be available at the bookstore later, too. I also have some business cards. If you're interested in learning about a career in publishing, I'd be happy to talk with you if, if you want to have coffee sometime. Um, or just send an email. We also have four credit internships in the fall and the spring. Right now we're looking for an intern for spring. It's an unpaid four credit internship that we can work part-time, working with your work schedule, or your school schedule. <laughs> and uh, I think that's all. Oh, we also have a, a contest, a picture book writing contest that you would be eligible for as long as you're not related to someone at our company and as long as you're a resident in the United States. Uh, we, it's, it's closing on November 17th, so I don't recommend uh, submitting something this year, unless you've been working on something for a while already. <laughs> Trust me, I don't, I don't want it. Um, <laughs> but next year, we'll do it again next fall, and you could, if you win, you win $5,000 and a chance to be published. So um, if you want to know more about that, you can pick up my card and send me a note, and I can send you more information. And I think Phyllis is going to read her book, and then if there's questions afterwards, we can, if there's time, we will do that. Time for that? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm um, perfecting the art of reading 
sort of sideways, but <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, I love about children's picture books are the front and back pages, and I think these are great. The illustrator for this book is Jenny Lovely, who I've never met, but she's uh, a young woman from Norway who lives in London, and I think, she, I mean, that's, that's one of the most exciting things to me, how an illustrator can take you, your words and really create a new world uh, uh, beyond what you have envisioned in your own mind. And um, when you have the right marriage there and you have a good publisher who can find the right, the right illustrator, it makes such a difference. And I, I love um, just the sensibility that she has brought to the book. So um, it opens with just a little background. It says, every Thanksgiving for more than 20 years, a family in upstate New York has hosted an outdoor Thanksgiving feast in the woods on their farm. Almost 200 friends, relatives, and newcomers join in the festivities each year, regardless of the weather. They bring food to share in a rustic woodland setting with bonfires for keeping warm and tarps overhead as protection from the snow or rain. It's a time of great celebration and joy with music and singing filling the air for this Thanksgiving in the woods. And then the story begins. When fall winds blow cold and jack-o'-lanterns lose their smiles, when branches lie bare and cornstalks rustle in the wind, that's when it's time for Thanksgiving in the woods. Days and days go by and I keep adding to my Thanksgiving pile a tool belt and my favorite rocks, a rope, seashells, a flashlight, and brownie. Everything I'll need for Thanksgiving in the woods. One chilly morning, Mama wakes me early. Today's the day, she says. I stuff all of my treasures into a backpack. Mama gathers boots and winter coats. Daddy grabs his guitar and my recorder. Come on, he says, let's get going to Thanksgiving in the woods. Now, if you're like the third graders I was reading to yesterday, you'll have started to pick up the refrain, and you'll start repeating it. <laughs> you don't have to, however. <laughs> it soon became a yell as we were going on. We drive and drive and finally turn onto a curvy gravel road. That's when I see Grandpa standing next to his orange truck. He starts the engine and I climb into the cab. Time to get ready for Thanksgiving in the woods. We drive over rutted fields, then down a slope to a clearing under trees that reach up to the clouds. I see the cousins building a fort right next to the little stream, a perfect place for our own Thanksgiving in the woods. Daddy and Grandpa unload long wooden planks for tables and bales of straw for us to sit on. Uncle Charlie makes a bonfire while neighbors hoist a tarp over branches. Everyone's rushing to get ready for Thanksgiving in the woods. Early the next morning, I'm one of the first ones to wake up. I can hardly wait for breakfast to be done. While grown-ups laugh and talk, kids pull on sweaters and boots. We want to get there first for Thanksgiving in the woods. Some neighbors are already at the site. Here, help stack up some kindling, Grandpa says, and we do, running whenever someone calls. We all need to help if we're going to have Thanksgiving in the woods. I'll just put a little insert here. With a children's picture book, it's really important to make the children the source of the action and not the adults. So um, you'll notice that it's the kids who are involved in, in, in doing the things. Soon a tractor comes over the hill. Grandma and Mama sit on the hay wagon, steadying a load of pots and covered pans filled with turkeys and dressing, mashed potatoes, peas, and corn. Oh, now it's starting to smell like Thanksgiving in the woods. The publishers use such heavy grade paper that it's hard to get it. <laughs> 
neighbors, relatives, and lots of people I don't even know cross the field to the hollow under the hemlocks. They carry baskets and bags and boxes filled with apples and pickles and pies, every imaginable food to share for Thanksgiving in the woods. And I think that spread is, is sort of um, inspired by this photo, which, you know, it's exactly what happens. There's a, there's a long incline um, down to the hemlock trees. At one o'clock, Grandma rings her special bell. We form a huge circle and sing, "'Tis the gift to be simple, "'tis the gift to be free." People talk for a long time about being thankful. Brownie gets very hungry, waiting until it's time to start Thanksgiving in the woods. Lines of people snake around the tables, filling plates with mounds of food. The cousins and I dart in and out, grabbing buns, turkey, and other treats to take to our fort. There we'll have our very own Thanksgiving in the woods. Grown-ups are playing fiddles, banjos, and drums, and singing songs that everyone knows. Soon Daddy joins in on his guitar, and I make up a tune of my own on my recorder, my way of celebrating Thanksgiving in the woods. We stand around the bonfire, warming up on both sides. Grandma passes out marshmallows, and I take two to roast, toasty and brown, one of my favorite parts about Thanksgiving in the woods. When everybody's had enough turkey and potatoes and pumpkin pie, people start packing up their gear. In groups of two or three, they walk back to the farmyard, bringing an end to Thanksgiving in the woods. Daddy puts me on his shoulders and we walk with Mama and Grandma along a candlelit path through the woods. I pull Brownie close to keep him warm, happy that he came along for Thanksgiving in the woods. And there really is this candlelit path through the woods to get back home. Back at the bonfire, I can hear a banjo and someone singing. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. Now that's the perfect ending, Grandma says, as we walk in the dusk. A perfect ending to Thanksgiving in the woods. And then there's the music. Um, I think there's time if anybody has any questions for one of the three of us. I will say, I, I just have to put in a plug for Spark House. It's been really fun to work with them. My first book was published by Random House, which is also a great place to get a book published. <clears throat> but when you get published by a really big publisher like that, you're um, kind of far down on the totem pole in terms of attention. Let's put they, I mean, Random House is really great, but uh, you know they don't they don't do a lot once the book comes out. And I, I felt like. Um, Spark House has really been thorough in its, you know, the, the questionnaire you fill out. I mean, it's so thorough, and there's just been all kinds of support and ideas and attention, and I really, really appreciate that. I think they've done an amazing <coughs> job. So, thank you guys. Any questions for any one of us? The, uh, the author's involvement in, in promotion of the book uh, you know, that was kind of a disappointment for me because you spend all your time and, and, you, and you get the baby out, you know, and then your work starts. I mean, then you, have you have to raise it. You have to you raise, have to raise it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So from your very personal point of view, maybe this book and the other book, what can you say about promotion after the book's been published? Well, I'm probably the worst poster child for social media and pro promotion. If I had done better on the first one, maybe things would be different. But um, I have recognized my weaknesses and the strengths of others, and I have retained the help of my one of my daughters who's helping me with some social media posts. Just I hate that kind of stuff, you guys. I mean, I'd rather just, it's like, I don't know fingernails on a chalkboard, but you don't even know what a chalkboard is. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, Monique uh, Kleinbusen, who's uh, a journalism grad, and one of my former students, is also helping with some uh, social media. 
that being said, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to always be thinking and be willing to get out there. I mean, to, uh, and you can't expect someone else to do it, like lining up, speaking in schools, uh, oh, and bookstores. Uh, I mean, Sparkhouse has set up one of the meetings that got coming up, but I, I also am always thinking about ways in which the book could be promoted and try to do my part. Um, so it's just, it's part of the, it goes with the territory that you have to do that. And I'm, I'm learning to feel a little more comfortable with that than I, than I was maybe three or four years ago. So, um, but when my daughter posts something with a word that should be capitalized that wasn't, and it's just like, oh no, you can't make it go away, make it go away. Or where there's some, you know, it's like, oh, just relax, and I'm like, no, this is going out into the world, it must be perfect, you know. It's not the way it goes, so. Um, it's humbling, um, and there's so much more, you know, that could be done. But it, it really, for me, it's been helpful, just to get other people's ideas. Um, so. Do you often have multiple projects going at once, or is this your life now? Or is this my what? Is this your life now? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I have, um, I would say, I don't know, seven or eight manuscripts that are in various stages of uh, creation. Some are much more um, well executed than others. Um, I think I have two that I feel like are close to being ready, but I, I don't know. You know, I keep working on different things, and I'm in a critique group, so I get critique, you know, from other people, um, and you know, you have to let some things. You know, I, I'm a, uh, the poster child for letting things lie fallow for a while. I mean, if any of you guys come from farm backgrounds, you know the value of letting the land just lie for a little while, and it's, it's good for it. And uh, we live in a culture that really uh, emulates quick production. And if you could, I mean, I used to work for a book publisher, and I could name names of some Christian book, public, book authors who've published, you know, his 40th book, his 85th book, and you want to say, uh, you know. <laughs> into that book and he had like one good idea and it was like spun and spun and spun. That's not what I want to do. Um, and I think the world oftentimes would be a better place if we just took a little more time with things. But um, I come from a philosophy that life is long and that there's plenty of time to do what God has for you to do. But that's a sermon for another day. <laughs> Other than making like five million dollars, how do you measure success with a book like this? Uh, well, it's obvious that I've, I've made $5 million. <laughs> uh, you don't make money publishing almost any book unless you, you, know, you get some formula and then it just it goes. But, um, you know, I measure success, honestly. I really do. Uh, the other day, somebody told me they had gotten my other book, um, It's Milking Time. And their, their little three-year-old, they said, we have to read it every single night because they just love that book. I, that's what I, I mean, that's what I want to do is write books for children and, and their parents and grandparents, the people who will buy them. Um, but how well they're received by, by kids is a real, that just feels so heartwarming to me. Um, I know that is maybe, sounds like something I'm supposed to say, but I really do. I mean, I'm, I'm retired, I'm, I'm not depending on this for bread and butter, so that helps immensely. Um, because if I were, I would be starving, um, or close to it. You know, and I mean, it, that, that being said, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having a bestseller and making lots of money. Uh, that hasn't happened to me yet, but I still love doing it and, and want to keep doing it as long as I can. So there, there's the saying, like, if, to be a good writer, you need to be a, a good reader or, or see, you know, have a lot of influences. Um, do you find that's true with your process? And if so, what have been, or even if not, what have been some influences for you, you know, be, this being into your second children's book? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I think you need just a lot of curiosity, and I'm not exactly sure how you how you teach somebody to be curious, but. Um, People who know me well would say I'm nosy. And I, I mean, it's you know, it's sort of a journalistic instinct. You're always asking questions. I mean, I read a lot of different stuff, and it's kind of a joke in my family. There's nothing I don't find interesting to read, including the free handouts when you go into a restaurant. I always pick them up because, you know, it's like, who would have thought there's a Korean newspaper right here, you know? And, you know, I, because there's, it's just interesting stuff. Now, does that, and I feel like all of that kind of melds together and trickles down in some odd way. Um, I, I have, in, in, to a certain degree, kind of pulled from my rural roots and, and kind of more classic stuff. I hope I'm not just writing a bunch of nostalgic whatnot, but trying to find a contemporary twist on something, more eternal truths, I guess. That, so that fits with the, the goals that Sparkhouse has. Um, but um, I don't know, I, I, I guess, I think it helps to be around kids and start to look at the world the way they look at things. But I do feel like in God's economy that nothing is wasted. And even times when it feels like, um, you know, that you're not going forward toward the goals that you've set, that doesn't mean that you're not going forward. There's, there's you know, you're maybe going in a circuitous route, but all that stuff goes in there some way. I'm still waiting for my three years as a real estate agent to come to fruition <laughs> in a book. But who knows? You know, I, mean, I might write a book for children about a parent who's a real estate agent. Ooh, that sounds like a, a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Or for, for um, Naomi or Carla? Well, thank you guys for hanging in there with us. <laughs> $18 cash or check made out to Bethel Campus Store. Maybe Phyllis would sign oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's an option. Also, a few of us are going to casually have lunch in the DC when we're done here. So if you want to join us to talk about publishing, that's great too. Probably about 12 15.